Hello everyone and welcome to QuickMed where medicine is explained quickly and easily. Today we will discuss the torch infection, so let's get to it. The term torch is actually an acronym for a group of diseases that cause congenital conditions if a fetus is exposed to them in the uterus. The T stands for toxoplasmosis, O is other and includes syphilis, R stands for rubella, C for cytomegalovirus or CMV, and H is for herpes simplex virus 2 or HSV2. We will discuss all of these diseases individually except for syphilis because we have a separate video on congenital syphilis, so feel free to check that one out as well. Alright, before we get started, the torch infections can be confusing because they often have overlapping signs and symptoms. So I wanted to highlight some of the non-specific findings that you might see that really are not going to help you parse out which infection is which. These nonspecific findings might be found in any of those test questions you might encounter, so look out for them. And they include hepatomegaly and jaundice, generalized lymphadenopathy, hemolytic anemia, and thrombocytopenia. Now that you're aware of some of these nonspecific findings that can present with really any of these diseases, let's cover some specific situations. Let's start with toxoplasmosis, which is caused by a protozoan parasite, and primary infection during the pregnancy can result in this disease. Infants can present with something called chorioretinitis, which is where you have inflammation of the retina and the choroid of the eye, and you can see findings like these on fundoscopic exam. Patients can also have hydrocephalus, which is an enlargement of ventricles, as you can see in this photo, as well as diffuse intracerebral calcifications. And to help you remember this, imagine that the calcifications are distributed in an X pattern, consistent with the X that you see in toxo. Babies can also have a blueberry muffin rash, which actually represents extramedullary hematopoiesis, which is where hematopoiesis occurs outside of the bone marrow. And given that these babies can already have jaundice, you might find this rash overlaid on top of skin that appears jaundiced. Let's now go over our next infection, rubella. And I want you to remember this as can't see, can't hear, because babies will have issues with both the eyes and the ears. As you can see here, babies can have congenital cataracts, but they can also have other ocular issues like glaucoma, which is where you have increased intraocular pressure in the eyes, as well as retinopathy. They can have cochlear defects leading to bilateral sensor or neural hearing loss, as well as cardiac defects like a patent ductus arteriosus or a PDA, as well as pulmonary artery stenosis. On this slide, I place a red star here to indicate that there are similarities between two infections that I want you to keep in mind, and I'll place them on any future slides in which there are similarities that we need to remember. Let's compare rubella and toxoplasmosis. As we mentioned, with toxoplasmosis, babies will have hydrocephalus, which can lead to macrocephaly. In comparison, in rubella, babies will often have microcephaly. In both situations, there can be a blueberry muffin rash, which is what I want you to keep in mind here. And in rubella, ocular findings will oftentimes present as cataracts, whereas in toxoplasmosis, they present as chorioretinitis. Let's now move on to our third infection, cytomegalovirus, which is actually the most common congenital viral infection. Unlike toxoplasmosis, in which you find that the calcifications are diffuse in nature, here the calcifications are periventricular or surrounding the ventricles. And you can remember this as a C pattern, consistent with the C in cytomegalovirus. There's also a red star here as well because babies can also have a blueberry muffin rash as well as cochlear defects which will lead to bilateral sensory neural hearing loss. But one thing to remember is that with congenital CMV, sensory neural hearing loss is the most common sequela. And now let's move on to herpes simplex virus 2 or HSV2 and in this case, babies can have one of three patterns. First is skin, eye, and mouth disease, in which they can have conjunctivitis that leads to frequent tearing, ulcers of the mouth and the tongue, as well as herpetic lesions, which are fluid-filled lesions on an erythematous base. This rash is often classically described as dewdrops on a rose petal. The second pattern is CNS involvement only, in which babies can have meningoencephalitis. And the third is disseminated disease, in which there is neonatal sepsis with multiple organ involvement. Surprisingly, these patterns occur with roughly equal frequency. Now that we've discussed some of the characteristic findings in each of these infections, let's go over a practice question like we usually do. Here we have a female neonate is born to a G1P1 mother who received little prenatal care. The mother denies having any fever, chills, or upper respiratory symptoms during pregnancy. She works at an animal shelter. At birth, the neonate is noted to be jaundiced with hepatomegaly. An ultrasound of the head reveals hydrocephalus. Further imaging reveals intracerebral calcifications. Let's go over some of the key parts of this question that will help us get to our answer. First, we have a mother who received little prenatal care, and this is often how these questions will present. 
And here the mention of the mom working at an animal shelter is probably not random as it's referring to a potential risk factor. And at birth, it says the neonate is noted to be jaundiced with hepatomegaly, which we said is a nonspecific finding. So let's look at more specific features here. We see that the neonate has hydrocephalus as well as intracerebral calcifications. And so this points us in the direction of congenital toxoplasmosis. And the mom working at an animal shelter further supports this answer because she's most likely coming in contact with dogs and cats and toxo can be transmitted through cat feces that contain the parasite. Another way that toxo can be transmitted is through the consumption of raw or undercooked meat. So let's end off on that lovely note, everyone, and I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please make sure to like and subscribe so that we can keep doing what we're doing, and as always, good luck studying, everyone.